Good morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, welcome. I want to welcome our visitors this morning. First of all, our guest soloist is Brandon Roy from Montreal. He is part of the Confederation Players uh, this summer, one of those doing various uh, historical vignettes around town. Uh, Martin is studying theater at uh, Sheridan College in Oakville, Ontario, so it's good to have him with us this morning. Also want to welcome Jane's and my daughter, Rebecca, who is on vacation from Glasgow in Scotland. I have uh, my sister, Charlotte Jackard, from Camoes Hill, Nova Scotia. Uh, my sister, Christina Miro, uh, from West Pubnico, Pubnico, Nova Scotia, and Christine's husband, Albert, who are with us. There are other members of the family here as well, but they ducked out on this morning's service. And uh, welcome to, to all who have gathered here. Following the service, there's going to be a time of conversation and refreshments. It's going to be in the gym um, this week because of threatening rain. And the strawberries continue. So there will be strawberries and ice cream again this week. So we hope you'll be able to share that with us. And of course, a welcome to those who are joining us via Eastlink Television. Happy birthday to Jean Pickard, whose birthday is July the 28th. Uh, Jean will be 91 on her birthday. <laughs> She's one of the great souls of this congregation. Just an update on the money given and pledged for the church roof, which has been replaced. So we're up to 57100 $30. Uh, the generosity of this congregation never ceases to astound me. So, um, well, we have a way to go, but we're getting there. And next, I'm going to ask uh, Steve Dowling, who is a member of the discernment committee, to talk to you a bit about the two opportunities for uh, congregational participation that are upcoming. Thank you. So, uh, discernment, a um, little bit about me uh, initially. As a, okay, as a new member of the congregation and of uh, Catholic heritage, the, uh, the concept of, of discernment, I would have thought, at least as a little boy, that there was no need for that. You just picked up the phone and uh, asked the Pope if you wanted a new roof or a new minister or something to that effect. So, um, and uh, I also took the, uh, the opportunity uh, to look up uh, the, the definition of uh, discernment for a discernment committee. The you own know, discernment would be to, to, uh, to uh, discover um, and detect. And for my own experience, certainly over the initial part of the, uh, the past 10 weeks where the committee's been meeting, uh, again, as someone uh, new to the church and of Catholic heritage, it's been my own experience has been more of the antonyms to discernment, which would be to, uh, to mis misconstrue and, and, uh, and misunderstand what, uh, what the church is all about. However, um, at the end, uh, now coming through 10 weeks of of uh, very hard work on the part of the committee. We are now in the position to invite participation from the congregation to, uh, to assist us through a series of facilitation sessions uh, to uh, undertake this very important uh, process of discernment. And I do invite uh, as many people as possible to come out uh, to our sessions, uh, the first one being August 4th, Tuesday evening, 6.30 till 9 o'clock. And uh, we have another one scheduled on August 29th, 9.30 until noon. Again, uh, it's been a very uh, informative uh, and, uh, you know, and, and rewarding experience thus far being involved in the committee. There's been a, uh, an incredible amount of hard work uh, done uh, by these uh, committee members and a fairly steep learning curve for uh, the little Catholic boy uh, from uh, uh, who's who's now uh, 
who's now uh, joined the church. So uh, again, I invite as many people as possible to come out. This process of, uh, of um, facilitation sessions with the congregation is really the heart of the process. This is where we need to uh, really uh, begin to engage as a congregation and, um, and uh, guide ourselves through this process of discernment. So again, invitation for August 4th, 6.30 till 9 o'clock, and August 29th, 9.30 until noon. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Not such a little Catholic boy, though. <laughs> the seventh annual gala dinner is sold out and uh, largely due to the salesmanship of Ellen Locke Daron, our office administrator. Um, I think she could sell the proverbial refrigerator to the proverbial Innu. Um, but anyway, it's sold out. There will be some horse trading going on as people suddenly discover that they have to be away or they have company coming or something like that. But uh, I'm confident that on the date, uh, September the 26th, that all the places will be filled. And we had some uh, arrivals after I gave the welcome. I know that uh, Joan and Kinsey Smith have members of your family with you. And I know you have Owen with you, right? And uh, yeah, there's Owen. And what's your brother's name? Luca. Okay. So and their and their parents are with them as well. So 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 welcome. And I think a few other visitors may have come in, so so welcome to you. And then just a reminder that next Sunday, the first Sunday of the month, we receive donations for the food bank. Lord, listen to your children praying. a person who said such wonderful things and did such marvelous things that people began to follow him. One day they asked, who are you? He answered them, I am the Lord. O oh God, how manifold are your works. There lies the great and mighty sea teeming with living things, both great and small. All these look to you to give them their food in due season. But when you hide your face, they despair. When you take away their breath, they die and return to dust. May your glory, O God, endure forever. When you look at the earth, it trembles. I will sing to God as long as I live. Hymn number 312, Praise with Joy, the World's Creator.
Let us pray. Holy One, we who draw breath from you gather in this place to know better the source of our being. We come to feast on your word and be nourished by ancient stories that are always new because they tell us the truth about ourselves, our failure, and our promise. We long to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge and be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. And we'll sing hymn number 356, Seek Ye First the Kingdom. We'll remain seated as we sing, and I'll ask the children who are here to gather at the front with Greg uh, during the hymn. Well, good morning. Good morning, Greg. You have very hairy faces. Oops, there you go. I see a face. Oh, there was another face. Oh, and I thought it was your faces, and it was the back of your head all the time. You need to look around this way so I can see you, because I have some stuff here I want to show you. Okay? Yeah. Everybody looking this way? There we go. I want to ask you what the, what, what, what is this thing? A ruler. Do you have a ruler? What do you do with rulers? Measure things. Mm, what about this? A measuring tape to use to measure things. This is a little different than this, though, isn't it? A lot longer. Why? Why? Where would I use these things? Do you think? Who? Big, big, big things, long things. Okay, there we go. Aha. Uh -huh. um, what about this? And where would you use the measuring cup? In the kitchen. And what would you? Okay, and only liquids? No. Powders? Aha, uh -huh. chocolate chips, yes. <coughs> And I have a picture here. I couldn't find one of these. What's this for? Measuring how high you are. Do you have one of those? No. You don't have one of those? At our cottage, uh, just by the kitchen on the side, we have not something like that, but we have where our boys, when they start to grow, when we put little measurements and we set the date. It's a growth chart. Okay. Okay, yeah. Just like you were moving as you were growing up, 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 up. Excellent. So what do they all have in common? The measuring cup, this, and this. They all measure things. That's right. That's right. They measure things. Now, <clears throat> um, did anybody ever say to you, this is kind of negative, you got to measure up. I'm glad no one's ever said that to you, because it's not a nice thing to say to people. Sometimes, uh, when, uh, uh, when people think we're not doing the best that we could, then they say, you better measure up. 
Anybody in the congregation ever have that said to them? Oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, you better measure up. And so that's a really negative thing because measuring up says we're not as good as we ought to be or we're not doing as well as we should and we should be much, much better. And you know, sometimes we are exactly where we need to be. And one of the wonderful things that I read in the Gospels, in the stories about Jesus, is Jesus said, yeah, you know what? You're pretty decent as you are. You're very cool. And I think in God's way of thinking, we are all measured up. We are all doing the best we can. And sometimes we don't do the best we can, but we're always like this. And I think God looks at the high points in our lives and says, you know what? You're doing your best, and I think and I know that you measure up. Does that make sense? Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Okay. We, I tell you what we can do. My story is not measuring up. My, my story is, you know, my that God, you know, that's right. That was John's comment. So, so, so anyway, as we think about that, we think about that God loves us no matter who we are and where we are, that God cares for us, whether we have hearing aids in or not, whether we wear glasses or not, whether we're blonde, brown, purple, green hair, no matter if we have body piercings in our nose or in our cheek or in our eyebrows, it doesn't matter. God still loves us, and we measure up. So let's have a prayer before we head out to uh, a time where we're going to, I think, have some special f uh, fun things happen, and uh, we'll, we'll be going down to the gym, okay? Let's have a prayer. Hi, God. Thank you for this day. Even though it's a little cool, we thank you for the wonderful water that surrounds us, the land that's growing. Thank you for everybody here and around the world. Big hugs. Thank you, God, for hugging us. Talk to you later, God. Amen. And let's stand up. And you can look at all the big people out in the congregation, and let's say that special prayer uh, that Jesus taught his disciples, and Oscar is going to share that prayer with us. Let's share together. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy Our kingdom come. Thy shall be done on earth, earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Okay, if you want to come with me, we'll zip downstairs, and we'll do some interesting things. The picture on the screen shows a rainy day activity at Camp Abbey. There have been many of those this summer, but the good news is that for the first time in a number of years, attendance at the camp is rising. So, uh, and the children, we have I think nine altogether from Trinity who have been attending various sessions. The first scripture is from the second book of Samuel, chapter 11. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go forth to battle, David sent Joab, his general, and all of his officers, and all of the army of Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and laid siege 
to the city of Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David had just wakened from his nap and was walking on the roof of the king's house, that he saw a woman taking a bath. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire who she was, and it was reported, this is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And so David sent for her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now the woman was purifying herself after her period. She went home, and later on she realized that she was pregnant. So she sent a message to the king, <coughs> telling him, I am pregnant. David sent a message to Joab, saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. When Uriah came to him, he asked how Joab was, and how the army was doing, and how the war was going. <coughs> and then he said, go down to your house and wash your feet, which is a euphemism for go sleep with your wife. And so Uriah went out, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah didn't go to his house. Instead, he lay in the entrance of the palace and slept there with all the king's servants. When David heard that Uriah had not gone to his house, he called him and said, Why didn't you go to your house? You've been on a long journey. Uriah said, The ark of Israel and Judah and all the army are in the open. The men are camped in open fields. And should I go and eat and drink? and enjoy myself with my wife. As you live and as the Lord lives, I will not do this thing. David said, very well, stay here today and tomorrow also, and then I'll send you back. The next day, he invited Uriah to a banquet and got him drunk. Uriah went out, but still he didn't go home. He slept at the entrance of the palace with all of the servants. So, David wrote a letter to Joab, his general, and sent it by Uriah's hand. And what he wrote in the letter was, put Uriah in the forefront of the fighting, and then fall back from him, so that he may be struck down and die. This is what is written in the second book of Samuel. A responsive psalm from both Psalm 14 and 53, and I'll ask you to join in singing the refrain. foolish have spoken in their heart and said, There is no God. God looks down from heaven upon us all to see if there are any wise and seek after God. Have they no knowledge of all those who do evil? But see, they will tremble with fear, for God is on the side of the righteous. Do not mock the hope of the poor, for God is their refuge. 
Oh, that deliverance for God's people would come forth from Zion. A reading from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 6, verses 1 to 15. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. 
Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said to the rest of the him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not be enough to buy bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place. So they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten them, they filled 12 baskets. When the other people saw the sign that they had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever awakened in the morning wondering if there would be anything for you or your family to eat this day? Have you ever had to send your children to bed hungry and listen to them crying from hunger all through the night? Have you ever watched someone you loved dying of starvation? Or if not of starvation, then from some disease caused by malnutrition? Have you ever considered selling one of your children into slavery in order to get enough money to buy food so that the others might survive? This is the reality even today for far too many of our brothers and sisters on this planet. And it was certainly the reality for a great many of the people among whom Jesus lived, especially those who made up the crowds he attracted. Everyone was hungry some of the time, and that was in a good year. If the crops failed, if the tax collector took too much, if a marauding army destroyed the standing grain, then death stalked the land. The people in power cared very little about the suffering of ordinary folk. Their main purpose was to extract as much wealth as they possibly could from their subjects. And if that meant hollow-eyed children and full graveyards, well, that was just the way of the world. Some people had, most people had not. Some people ate their fill, others went hungry. No wonder the story of the feeding of the 5,000 so gripped the imaginations of early Christians. It's the only miracle story that appears in all four canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. For good measure, Matthew and Mark have another version, uh, the feeding of the 4,000. 
I suspect in this world in which Jesus moved, it was bigger news even than the raising of the dead. Sure, it would be nice to rise from the dead someday after I die, but right now my main concern is finding enough to keep my family alive. The story spoke to a deep and abiding anxiety. And we ask, how could Jesus do this? How could he feed so many with so little? Just five barley loaves and two fish. And those of us who are uncomfortable uh, with anything that doesn't fit our rational mindset I might say that what happened was that Jesus used the generosity of the boy who shared his lunch to inspire others in the crowd to share the food they were hoarding or to shame them into it. Thus, it becomes a bit like the old story of the stone soup. You remember the traveler who tricked the stingy villagers into feeding him uh, by telling them that he would show them how to make soup with nothing but a stone. And then, of course, suggested that the flavor would be improved if they had an onion, maybe, a potato, some cabbage, a few carrots, and a bit of meat. Or we might consider what St. Augustine of Hippo said, that miracles are not contrary to nature only to what we know of nature. I don't think we need to get really caught up in this question of how did he do it? First of all, this story is a scathing critique of a world of enforced scarcity, a world of inequality, in which the good things are held by very few, and in which uh, so many go in need and at the risk of their lives because of that need. It was a critique of the world of Jesus' time, and I think it is a critique of how we arrange our communities in this time. And over against this enforced scarcity, over against this parsimony of the wealthy, there is set God's overflowing abundance. The story is reminiscent of the one in the book of Exodus, where the people on the road to freedom are sustained by the mysterious food, the manna from heaven, and the quails blown mysteriously upon the camp. It also is reminiscent of a story in the second book of Kings in which the prophet Elisha feeds a hundred people from the first fruit of one man's offering. Give some to the people and let them eat, for thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. And it echoes the prophecy of Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord God will perform, will prepare a rich feast for all peoples. And then there is the messianic banquet of which Jesus' rabbi contemporaries spoke. The banquet at the end of time, uh, when all would be invited to feast. We think there is nothing. We harp on scarcity. We say, if you're hungry, that's just the way it has to be. There's nothing to be done. And then these stories of God's goodness, of God's abundance, challenge our way of thinking, challenge us to reimagine the world, and challenge us to rethink the way we construct our society, and challenge us to rearrange our priorities. Now, the people who were sitting there on that hillside 
eating the bread and fish and found it hard to get their minds around something like this just as, as we do. And so they, they opted for an easier solution. What if this Jesus, with this strange power to feed people, were our king? John says they wanted to seize him and make him king. They had seen something awe-inspiring. They'd seen something marvelous. And what did they want to do? Well, they thought maybe uh, they could settle for making Jesus a king like Herod Antipas, a tyrant who could feed us. Or, or maybe a, a more benevolent uh, version of the Roman governor Pontius Pilate, just so long as our bellies are full. If ever there was a moment for Jesus to seize the throne of his ancestor David, this would have been it. He might have been able to lead a ragtag army to Jerusalem. He might have been able to occupy the city for a while. He might even been, have been able to mint some coins until the Romans regrouped and crushed him and slaughtered all the people who supported him. And Jesus was not having any of that because he understood, I think, that you cannot bear witness to the kingdom of God if you are going to be a king of this world. You, you always have to be at odds with the kings of this world if you're going to bear witness to the kingdom of God. In, in Matthew and Luke, there are the temptation stories where Jesus is offered all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. If only he will worship the devil. And Jesus says, you shall worship the Lord your God and God only shall you serve. When Jesus goes away to the mountain by himself and to avoid be, being dragged to Jerusalem and proclaimed king, I think that's John's version of that story in the temptation narratives. David, Jesus' ancestor, was by reputation the greatest and best of all Israel's kings. And yet even David couldn't resist the temptation to grab, to assert his authority, and to abuse his power. Walking on his palace roof late one afternoon, he sees the beautiful Bathsheba, and he wants her, and he takes her. Never mind that Bathsheba is married to one of his fighting men. Never mind that she's purifying herself after her period and therefore sexually off limits even to her husband. Never mind that David has a whole harem full of beautiful women at his beck and call. He will have what he wants. This is how kings behave. Old Samuel warned the people about this uh, when they clamored for a king in the first place. He said, the king will take your sons and force them into the army. The king will take your daughters and make them part of his harem. The king will seize your crops and your livestock in order to enrich himself. This is what kings do. But they said, we want a king anyway. We want to be like the nations. Later on, Jesus observed that the great ones among the Gentiles lorded over them, and their rulers are tyrants over them. David is just living up to expectations. In this story, it's easy to lose sight of Bathsheba, 
Uh, we, she often gets overlooked in the, the very dramatic story of the prophet Nathan's confrontation of David, accusing him of adultery and murder, and of the equally dramatic story of David's remorse and repentance, to which we'll come next week. Bathsheba, however, is no mere victim. She refuses to be a victim. Now, she might have just accepted what happened. She might have tried to trick her husband when he came home. Well, the baby came prematurely. You remember in the old days, in some areas when babies came very prematurely, often about a month or so after the wedding. Um, well, these things happen, you know. Um, but she wouldn't do that. And she called David to take responsibility for what he had done. I am pregnant, she said, and the child is yours. It takes considerable courage and to call a king to take responsibility, to stand up to someone like David and say, you're not going to have your fun with me and then throw me aside. There's a child here. There are consequences, and now we have to deal with that. David, of course, figured that if he could trick Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, into thinking the child was his, then the problem would go away. And when he couldn't do that, then he had Uriah, in effect, murdered. The problem would go away. Of course, it didn't go away, because these things have a way of compounding themselves. Now, the story goes on. The, the child born of uh, this first union of David and Bathsheba uh, soon dies. But later on, they are married, and another child is born, and that child's name is Solomon. And as David is dying, Bathsheba emerges as a power in her own right. She is the queen mother who counsels Solomon and guides him in a strategy that will gain him the throne in the face of lots of older and, in many eyes, better qualified rivals. So this sordid tale, uh, which might simply have been of one more woman uh, left a victim, is the beginning of a story which opens the future, which opens the future for us, in fact, because the last mention of Bathsheba is in the New Testament in the Gospel of Matthew, where she is listed as one of the ancestors of Jesus. A commentator named Mark Harris says, maybe if we look at Bathsheba, grandmother of Jesus, several times over, we can remember that Jesus carries in himself a heritage of formidable women, as well as a heritage of kings. Bathsheba gathered from the wreck of her life, the wreckage caused by a king, fragments, and from that built a future for her son and grandson, many times removed. She becomes part of the memory of hope among the fragments, a hope made perfect in Jesus. I think that David had, or that Jesus has a great deal more in common with Bathsheba, his many times removed great-grandmother, than with David, his distant grandfather. David, or Jesus, is, is a bit like Bathsheba. He, he works among the fragments. He works among the outcasts and the discards. He works among those who are victimized by the kings and the powerful of this earth. And he gathers them up, gathers them in, and he looks for fragments of hope from which a future can be built 
and from which a new and better day might dawn. When Jesus tells his disciples at the end of the, the, the feeding story, gather up the fragments so that none may be lost, he's not just being frugal, he's stating his mission. Gather up the fragments so that none may be lost. And if you think that's too much of a stretch, remember that later on in the same story, Jesus says, all that the Father has given me will come to me. And anyone who comes to me, I will never drive away. I have come to do the will of the one who sent me, and this is the will of the one who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that has been given me, but raise it up at the last day. Jesus is a gatherer of fragments, the one who goes looking for what's considered unimportant by the people who imagine themselves important. And if we recognize our own brokenness, our own fragmentation and how scattered we are, then we find Jesus present with us. We find Jesus working among us. Even today, it's difficult for us to think of ourselves in this fashion because we have this long history of being privileged, being allied with the people in power. And we can't imagine what it's like to be with those people who are on the outside, except when we look around, here we are on the outside with them. But the good news, it's precisely in that recognition that we find Jesus doing his healing work. And he invites us to join him in that healing work, to find the fragments of hope and to find healing for ourselves and for the world. And may it be so. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hymn number 355, For the Crowd of Thousands. Let us take time to pray. Let us pray. We gather, O oh God, in the warmth of this building, the warmth of smiles, the warmth of friends, the warmth of the familiar, the warmth of each other, and the warmth of your presence that is with us. 
a presence that oftentimes baffles us, a presence that oftentimes pushes and nudges us, a presence we feel is very mysterious, very other than us. We gather today, O oh God, many of us here who are well-fed. Many of us at times choose to go on diets because we just have consumed way too much. And yet that's not the reality of most of our world. Indeed, that's not the reality of people even in this quiet island community, the gentle island, I think, oh God, we call it. And yet, there is enough to go around. Yet, there are places that need deeply the touch of respect and care and food. We come, O oh God, as a church community that is reaching out in many ways. We ask, O oh God, that in the areas that we neglect, we ask that your spirit might nudge us and move us, that you might show us new visions, new ways of being the church in this community and in the world and this island. We come, O oh God, as your people. Yes, we often do not measure up in the eyes of our friends, in the eyes of others around us, but in a very real sense, O oh God, from where we sit and where we stand, from where we live and where we play, we are trying to be the church. So we ask, O oh God, that you be with us in all that we have, all the stuff that we think is necessary. We ask that those things might be removed from our eyes and we might see more clearly of how you would envision the world, of how you would move us into your world. Be with us. Be present among us as we go forward. Take us by the hand if you have to and place us in areas that need your help, your care, your vision. We ask it in the name of the ever-living and the ever-present God whom we worship. Amen. So now it's time to share our gifts so that the lives of many may be blessed. Your offerings will be received.
praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, Praising my Savior all the day long. Let us pray. God, gather up these fragments, for some of us all we can give, for others all we are willing to give. By your grace, make them a source of life and hope for all the people. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Our concluding hymn is number 339, When Morning Gilds the Skies. What words does the image on the screen suggest? May we be carried by the warm currents of God's love. May we be borne up 
by the rising tide of God's mercy. May we be carried safely on to our home. And now may grace, mercy, and peace, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon us this day and all days. Amen.